There we go. Yeah. All right, we got it now. Okay, we'll call the meeting to order. Jim, if you can take uh, roll call, please. Okay, Adler. Here. Strands. Here. Carter. Here. Curly. Here. Baumler. Here. Schindel. Here. Gardebretton. Here. All present. All right. Ken, can you leave us in the pledge? Sure. The pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Debbie, do we have anyone up for public comment at all? No. No? Okay. Move on from that. Uh, next up, we have the minutes to approve for the October 17th meeting. Clint, I move for approval of the minutes from the uh, October 17th meeting. Okay. Motion by Jan. Second. Second by Chad. Any other discussion? Vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. All right. Move on to the uh, financial report. Take a look at your financial report. Uh, cash on hand as of October 1st, 2022, in the amount of $2,060,050. One of the things to take a look at is your October receipts. You see the cash flow borrowing there in the amount of $3,633,770. Again, the reason for that short-term borrowing is the uh, state aid will come in in December. Um, and as you can see, without that short-term borrowing, we would be in a negative capacity at this point. Uh, also, you can see there are 66,772 uh, for the sale of the 10.01 acres to the city of Oconto Falls. That's from the county I property that's right behind me. If you look at October disbursements, um, the amount is $2,387,094, which left cash on hand in the amount of $3,542,268. Um, you'll notice that October disbursements are higher than normal. That includes the one-time payment of ESSER dollars is in there along with the two payrolls. Looking at November, November disbursements in the amount of $765,791. November receipts, $5,849, which left cash on hand as of today, November 14th, $2,782,326. Any questions on that first page? Okay. We'll go to the next page, we'll walk through the funds. As you know, Fund 21 is broken into three different pieces. Uh, the first one is Veterans Memorial, a portion of Fund 21, have a change in interest of $24, a balance of $28,656. You take a look at the next, the scholarship fund of Fund 21, you can see that there was $20 towards supplies. There's also a change here that you haven't seen yet, for a while at least, is we we're taking some of these dollars and now investing them into CDs because interest rates are moving up to the point where we can try to utilize some of that interest. <clears throat> so there's a $70,000 CD and then $14,057. So minus the 20 gives you a balance of $84,057. You look at the activity fund, um, you'll notice that there's $56 in interest. And again, there's an amount held in CDs of 170,000 which along with the balance of 124,964 leaves a sub-balance then of $294,964. Go over to funds 3839, change is $32 in interest and the balance is $38,086. Fund 41, expansion fund. You can see there that there's $48 in interest, $100,000 has been moved into a CD with the 14,730 leaves a balance of $114,730. Capital improvement fund 46, you can see there's $2,526 in interest, leaving a balance of $2,990,735. And then fund 73, there's $1,356 in interest, expenditures of 19,038. 
is a balance of $1,585,163. Any questions on any of those funds? So again, one of the major differences is starting to invest some of those dollars. One of the things that Kim will be looking at this month then is those fund $46. Some of those are going to be invested as well. So that'll be for the next month. Just a question, I guess. Um, I mean, should we say cash balance or something like that? I mean, because really, you know, it's a little bit deceiving the way it, not, not deceiving, but I mean, it's not as though the balance went down by that amount. We have that, we have that, you know, associated money sitting in a CD. Kim and I talked about it. She's going to adjust the format because now that you've put this in there, it's kind of changing the way that the format looks. So you're going to have what your balance is, but you're going to be able to see how much of that balance is in a CD versus how much of it is cash available. Okay. Thanks. Yep. So I guess that's the silver lining with interest rates going up as we yeah. start to invest in that. Ken? I move that we approve the uh, financial report in the uh, payment request in the amount of $1,426,245. We'll call vote, please. Motion by Ken. We need a second. I'll second. Second by Sarah. And Jan, if you can do a roll call. All right. Schindel? Yes. Baumler? Yes. Early? Yes. Carter? Yes. Adler? Yes. Strands, yes. Garterbrecht? Yes. 7 0. On to uh, reports and discussions. Uh, student representative report. Can we have you stand by the podium so the viewers can come to you over here? Over here. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> we get to be the first one to go that way. Go ahead. Um, all right, so student representative report. Um, we have the so far this month, Student Council has officially opened our Student Council Cafe. We opened it on November 7th, and since then it has been very busy and very lively. The cafe was designed to give council members experience and what to expect with the work environment and to create delicious morning beverages for teachers or students. And then students who were in FFA, students partners partnered with Okano County Farm Bureau at local high schools to deliver thank you farmers, thanks to area farmers. They did a whole bunch of tours, including the robot dairy tour, the horticulture tour, the agronomy industry tour, the swine industry tour, and the opening session. And then the forensics team will begin forming the 2023 season when it's inter, inter, formal, inter interformational meeting will be held on November 21st. The state organization has been rebanded to the Wisconsin Interscholastic Speech and Dramatic Arts Association association and has been updated to several categories. Conference coaches have met to claim the first competition, the NEC tournament at Marinette High School on Monday, February 6th. Um, the drama team ended its competitive run at the sectional theater festival hosted by O'Connell Falls. Within a field of 13 other schools, the Panthers gave a wonderful performance, but it just wasn't enough to get by the judges to move on a state. The community received the chance to see the one act play, Club 40 Verona, Friday, November 11th. After a short hiatus, the club will begin working on their spring production that will also recognize Mr. Gander's 25th anniversary as a director. And for Art Club, they hosted their Halloween project night where they painted pumpkins, painted faces, watched movies, and ate food. Does anyone from the board have questions about anything we did this month? All right. So. Thanks for the report. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next, uh, we've got the 2022 homecoming and prom follow-up report. Mr. Moore was going to do that. And uh, this topic, um, I think we had a we had an informational session probably a year ago on this uh, regarding some changes that happened to prom. I think at that point in time. Uh, you know, the board was in agreement that, hey, it sounded like a good idea. Um, we've now had an opportunity to have both prom and homecoming with those changes. So 
Um, we asked uh, Dan to come and give a give a follow up on that, how it went, any feedback. Um, and then, you know, based on that, I wanted to open it up for discussion for the you know members of the board. We also have some new members to be able to, you know, weigh in and then also give some time if people want to get more feedback from the from the community. If it's something that we as a board want to take action on in the future, if we do think there's there's needed changes, it allows us an opportunity to kind of openly discuss here in the in the in the board session. So floor is yours, Mr. Moore. Hey, thanks. Um, so last March, I came in and presented um, the discussions that we had last year about homecoming and prom. We had our student council that had a lot of discussion and, and ideas about, you know, how to maybe restructure that. Talking about the courts, okay, this was really talking about prom court and homecoming court and how that would work. We had a staff leadership group that also um, discussed some ideas and um, eventually came up with a plan that both the staff group and the student council group thought was a strong plan. Uh, we kicked it out. We had some concerns that were expressed, and so then we surveyed our entire student body on some of the main points, adjusted the plan a little bit in alignment with that feedback we got from the student body, and um, communicated that out to the parents and to the students. And we implemented, implemented the plan and exactly as we said um, that we would do. Um, there were no changes in how it was implemented. So we had um, a vote among the junior class for prom court last spring, um, separate from a vote for homecoming court this fall for our seniors. Um, <coughs> we limited participation to only being able to be on one court or the other. Again, this was all in alignment with what our student body um, recommended. Um, we opened up the homecoming eligibility. In the past, it had been only varsity letter winners. The feedback was we should make it more inclusive to students that were actively participating in other co-curriculars that weren't necessarily athletic co-curriculars. And so we opened that up. And um, we had each of the courts being comprised of 18 students. There were no gender quotas saying we had to have nine boys and nine girls. That was the top vote getters in the grade level. Um, depending upon, you know, kind of how the results turned out, um, the students then decided their pairings, how they would be announced, you know, at the, at the dance. No one was required to walk with anyone that they weren't comfortable with or be paired. They could walk in with a pair, they could walk in in a group of three, they could walk in individually. Um, and we also maintained having a prom king and a prom queen, as was the kind of the will of the student body. And um, it, it worked fine um, for both prom and homecoming. I didn't have any feedback directed to me. I know Dean had um, a parent that expressed the concern to him. Dean directed that parent to come talk to me. The parent did not do that, so I reached out to the parent. Um, really, the parent had no specific concerns that he could point to um, because I asked. I said, what, what do you feel we're not doing that we said we were doing? And there wasn't anything because we implemented exactly the way we said we would. So um, I guess I'm, I'll open it up for questions. If there were some things that came to your attention, um, there were not things that came to me. And um, I feel like what we what we put into place is in alignment with what students in the building wanted and also in alignment with our school's attorney and his recommendation for how we, how we structure um, that piece about um, not having quotas of boys and girls, that he was very clear that that would be um, opening us up to some issues in alignment with current um, legal opinion. So, questions? So, I had a few parents talk to me mm -hmm. about homecoming. As far as I know, as far as my parents know, prom was, the, or uh, homecoming was about, you know, the football players, the seniors. I guess, why would you want to change the chain. I mean, every year, I mean, <clears throat> and I'm on their side. I think, you know, homecoming is for football seniors. 
So I guess I didn't know what to say to him. I'm like, I would ask, but mm -hmm. I mean, I guess I guess, I guess my, my response to that would be, you know, we talk about wanting to try to empower students to have a voice in their school. And when that view was expressed that, you know, that student that's out for the musical is a good representative of the school. And why wouldn't that student be able to be on homecoming court or that student that is in FFA and is an officer and is maybe doing some wonderful things, you know, at the national level, um, but isn't into athletics. Why wouldn't that student be able to represent our school on homecoming court? Why does it have to be football players? And I get that. I mean, some there's there's definitely opinion out there that it should be about football. And why is that? It's not 1985 anymore. And so, you know, having the football players be the court and bring the girlfriends along as the, the rest of the court, that's an it's, a, it's an opinion. It's not the opinion that the majority of our students felt like was the way we should go with it. I think that's one of the things that I noticed on your paperwork, Dan. It looks like 66% of the students, when surveyed, felt that it should go the way it is now to offer the co-curricular piece, and 34% felt it should just be varsity Leonard winners. So about a two out of three split. So, What we did is we opened it up to students that had been involved in co-curriculars for four semesters of their, um, you know, that would be up through the end of their junior year. So they had six semesters at our school. If they were involved in co-curriculars for four of those, they were eligible. And we even left in the criteria that if you won a varsity letter, you were automatically eligible too. So even if it was just someone that, you know, all they did was play football and they won two varsity letters, they wouldn't have met the four semester co-curricular criteria, but they would have met the varsity letter criteria. So we maintain that kind of special place for varsity letter winners, but we just expanded it some. So I don't know how to answer your, your point, Chad. I guess um, I, I feel like, you know, we need to try to look at what the students are, are asking us and say, well, why did we do it that way? We did a lot of things a certain way in the past, and that doesn't mean that we always have to continue doing them the same way. How, what was the, how was the balance as far as like boys and, and girls? Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't equal. I believe there were a couple more girls than boys. Okay. For both? Probably so. Okay. And then the survey, the student survey, is that a pretty accurate representation? I mean, when you send the survey out, is it, can you, do you know, is it a, the entire student body that's actually responding or are you only getting a 20% or 30% no. or how mm -hmm. many of that student body is actually responding? It was 45% student body. Can and who all got it, the survey? All the freshmen, sophomores, and juniors last year that would be subject to whatever the results were. But I think that really speaks to how important that really is to the student body. My sense is, and, and I think that 45% of the respondents kind of reinforces it, is it's not a big deal to most of our students. Most students are not gonna be on a court. And so to them, it, it's not really as important. And so that's not to say that it's not important to some students, but to 55%, it wasn't important enough to weigh in. And so I guess I look at it as say, how much time do we continue to spend on this issue? There were hours and hours that were spent on it last year. And at some point, <coughs> there are going to be some people that are not going to be happy with the outcome. And so Okay, I mean, I don't know how many concerns there were, but how many concerns does it take to keep bringing up an issue that we we had a leadership group, we have the student council that discussed this issue at length. 
and had a plan and we had teacher leaders in the building that discussed it and then we kicked it up for even more feedback and i think every time we have prom or homecoming we're going to get some more people that are going to come and say they don't agree because it was great back in 1985 when it was all football players and that's not going to be a decision i'm going to implement is to go back to that if the board would like to do that that's certainly you know your prerogative to say we think that's really important um i don't think it's in alignment with what our students in our building want and so i, I guess and i don't think it's important to them so i guess i'm not quite sure you know why i mean we had this 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 was on the agenda in march I presented this very plan to this board. There were no questions or concerns expressed. Parents had a right to attend. There were some people that didn't agree with the plan that were in the audience. They didn't say anything. We had our school attorney in the audience ready to field questions and speak to that. So um, there, were, there, were no, there was nothing that came to me, nothing. The one that came to Dean Dean directed the parent to talk to Dan, and he didn't do that. And he had he had nothing of substance when when his point to Dean was, um, Mr. Moore's not following the plan. I was offended by that because the plan was followed to a T. And when I talked to him about it and said, "What part of the plan wasn't followed?" and he had no answer. So. There are huge things that we have to deal with at the high school. There are courses, there's dual credit opportunities, there's mental health issues, there's this, that, safety, all these things. I think we need to put this to bed. January. Yeah, I, thanks for the review tonight. Um, I think that um, it was great that the plan uh, was presented, it was carried out, it came through in that, the way it did. Um, one of the things that was kind of resonating in my mind, Dan, when you're reporting now is over the years, it, when my kids were in school too, some of the things surrounding homecoming in particular changed because it was all about football when I was in high school and for many, many years for a lot of people. But as society started recognizing that while the football program is certainly a good thing and it happens to be in the fall and somehow, some way, that was a big deal. Um, over the years, we began to recognize that, well, it's not just football players. There are other athletes that are doing things in other times of the year, and we don't have a special deal for uh, basketball teams or volleyball or baseball or, you know, whatever it is, wrestling. So it seems like over the years, it's morphed to the point where we take the opportunity in the fall and maybe, you know, it's just a lack of understanding. But in, at that particular time, it happens to be called homecoming. You call call it meatloaf it doesn't matter it's called something and that's a time that students get to celebrate and they get to do a lot of cool things and i think it's great it's the majority of the students who like it this way and i think i would just really hope we just go forward with what the plan is it had a test here it worked it's great let's just do it and that's it so did you have any students drop out off the court for their three bullets Walking down the aisle with this same. None that I know of. None that I know of. My only my only concern is that the student bodies got their adequate say in it. I mean, that's for me. It's not. It, obviously, we have the final say on which way it goes. But I think the students are the ones that should have the most say. And as long as their input is taken in, that's my concern. Well, I would like to make a motion to have the senior football guys we know. have it in so in this meeting we have in a reports and discussion okay. so i wanted to have open dialogue and then gain feedback from everybody on is this something you know others support you know chad you and i had a conversation i know there's some concern there um but i want to have open dialogue both to hear what dan had to say and if others think you know this is something that we need to bring bring back up and have a a formal vote on or if people want to get more feedback from the community that's fine um, but if not then we've we've had our had our discussion on it um so when it's the right time to make a motion on it then if if we deem that it is something that requires that 
we want to have on as an actual voting item. I think that's prudent. Also with feedback from the from the school attorney on, on making any change. So if there's, I mean, if there's others on, I guess, do others on the board have an opinion that this is something we think should be formally formally voted on? <coughs> I'd like to see it brought up and we can do it in a future future session. I had some, but, par I had some parent concerns, but I think they once they heard what the plan was and how it worked out, the concerns dissipated, so I don't see the need. I would echo that. There were some concerns, but they seem to have been um, satisfied by what took place or what the what the plan was in March mm -hmm. moving forward, and I haven't heard anything since. So. And I'm open to, you know, if, if, if anyone has other subsequent conversations, you know, now that this is a topic that, you know, was out in the community that we, we had Dan kind of give an overview of it and there's strong opinions and you guys get additional feedback. You know, I know Chad got, got some feedback. It sounds like others did too, but those seem to have subsided. Um, again, if there's more then people want to bring it up, we can, we can do that. Brian, any thoughts? <clears throat> Uh, my, my comment to it, and I think I said it back a year ago in March when we had it, is I, I'm a proponent of having it opened up to um, students who exhibit the qualities we're looking for. Um, you know, if you're a good student in arts or drama or anything else, um, in my mind, not everyone's an athlete. And I, I feel it's important to keep it open. This is where I still sit. I think that um, I pretty much agree with the, the comments that have been made. Uh, and as, as Dan kind of alluded to, the only reason that there might be some parents uh, uh, that uh, look at this as being football related would be because of tradition and their history and not necessarily uh, what's going on now. Uh, so I, I uh, don't have an issue with that. And I would like to commend Dan and uh, Danny for the work that they did uh, in involving the students, gathering input, having our student leadership group uh, discuss this, work with us, and come up with a plan that uh, that that ultimately was adopted and uh, apparently uh, worked quite well. At the same time, I think now if Chad uh, wishes, I mean, he can request that this be put on a future agenda, correct? Yeah, well, and, and Chad, Chad did request that. I wanted to have, you know, I wanted to have an open discussion, allow everyone to kind of give their feedback and also know that um, really give everyone an opportunity. If it is something that we think, you know, others do feel it is something that is prudent to have it voted on, that we have an opportunity to A, have the discussion and then an opportunity for a month's time, let's say, to gain additional feedback. And between now and then, if someone someone who's, I mean, I don't think it's it's worth bringing up and rehashing if there's not other people that have gotten specific support. I think Chad has, you know, very clearly made it known that, you know, hey, he's in support of it going back to the traditional football, football only. Um, but if there's not other support, I guess, or people get that, that feedback, I don't think it's prudent to, that would be a vote. But we are giving everyone an opportunity to go get additional feedback. And again, you'd come to me over the course of the next month. And if others you know, get that, then we can certainly do something different. And also I would talk to the attorney to see if there's anything and any also substantial keep, concerns. And hopefully keep the student's wishes in mind. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay, okay. all right, thanks Dan. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have the uh, Middle School Mini Business World Report. Good to see young faces in the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hello, school board members. Um, I'm Beth Trotman. I teach sixth grade math at Washington Middle School, and I brought along with me Matt Torrent from sixth grade, Nick Schrader from sixth grade, Max Adler from seventh grade, and Landon Dalfoss from eighth grade. And they're going to tell you what a recent experience they had at Wisconsin's mini business world. So the people on the screen were the people chosen to go to the mini business world. 
Um, this specific category of people were chosen because they tested advanced on the board exam last year. This was at the CSA building in Gillette on October 10th, 2022. Um, we had to create a product, uh, build a prototype, uh, create a marketing plan, and form a budget. After that, we decided to make our prototypes, and on the right is the materials we had to make our prototype. Uh, we had to work together with students from other schools, and those schools were Leona and Goodman and they were from eighth grade and seventh grade, and we were assigned in random groups of four to seven. In those groups of four to seven, there were four different roles that we could choose from within our group. There was finance, marketing, we picked a CEO, and production, and depending on your role, you had different tasks within the overall task. At the end, we constructed a trifold, and we gave a presentation to a panel of judges our product. My product was in the bottom right, and we made a shoe cleaner. A what? A shoe cleaner. Shoe cleaner. <laughs> in the upper middle is my product, along with Owen Wallace. He was also there, and he worked with me, and we made a heated driveway. Uh, <laughs> my group is in the, mid, so the bottom middle. And I'm with Emma Potter, and we made Bluetooth sunglasses. Um, my group's on the top right. I was with Abby Elson, and we made a portable outlet. Jake, so after you were done giving your presentation, the panel of judges evaluated every group. At third place was me and Abby's group with the portable outlet. At second place was Max and Owen Wallace's group with the heated driveway. And at first place was Abby Kuhn and Weston Hoskins' group with an auto light. Um, for our outcomes, we had a better, a better understanding of um, that, that, uh, we learned more entrepreneurship. Uh, we had better career opportunities in Wisconsin, and we played an important role in business in our communities. Anybody have any questions? I just want to know where I get a heated driveway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tonight. Yeah. Do you have to plug in the heated driveway into the portable outlet? <laughs> <laughs> very clever. Yeah, very awesome. cool. What was your favorite part of the day, each of you? Um. Well, there was a few different sections I didn't really go over. So uh, we introduced ourselves with a Kahoot based on uh, companies around Wisconsin. Uh, after that, we decided to, we went on to decide what our product was gonna be and then we made it and presented it. Um, we were also the only group, the only school that invited kids that were the advanced in the board exam. The other schools just brought like a certain class. It didn't matter like the skill level. It was just their class in that grade. Unlike us who brought sixth, seventh, and eighth, and it was the top board exam tests. So. My favorite part was getting to know kids from all over Wisconsin. like. They said there are three different schools and we were in groups with kids that we didn't know at all. So it was fun getting to know them. My favorite part was when we tried making our own product and we had to all the prices and all the sales and it was fun. Thank you. Very cool. Yeah, so not a not a question but a comment. You should all feel very proud of all your efforts and all your work. It's fantastic to see young minds like this at work and um, bright future for all of you. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any people that have a change of, what, of potential career plans because of this opportunity? Uh, I don't really think so, but it really presented us with a wider opportunity. Very good. Provoking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it gave us a great understanding of like the large range of businesses in Wisconsin.
Yeah. Well done. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. Thank you. <laughs> Hard to follow that one up, but uh, I was, was going to say, <laughs> note to self. Next time, come before. <laughs> nice job. Thank you, guys. Get your homework done tonight. <laughs> I was going to say, take the night off. <laughs> Good point there. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. All right. District Administrator's report. Oh, my goodness. All right. I'll, uh, I'll try and spice this up, but it won't be as good as the kids. Um, <laughs> nothing to review. There's a lot of different activities going on. Uh, you as a board took action at the last board meeting relative to um, post-employment benefit uh, insurance options. And we, after that action, did an informational meeting with our retiree group. And it's important to note that that was received extremely well because they have a lot more options now of how to utilize their post-employment benefit. So I appreciated the district office staff pulling that meeting together and that was well received and appreciated by our retirees. Uh, also had a chance to get my flu shot along with 58 other people. Uh, Robin Health's partnership, uh, which was set up and coordinated by Debbie Woods. Um, Another example of supporting some of our staff. I uh, had an opportunity to attend some volleyball games. If you're not aware, the girls' volleyball had a really great year. Had a chance to get to the sectional level of play. Um, did a great job as a team. So enjoyed watching our girls. Coaches did a great job, and it was neat to see all of the support from the community members. Uh, attended a WASDA regional meeting, and one of the things that came out of that is the importance of staying. Uh, involved in communicating with our representatives. So one of the key pieces is how we currently fund public education. Uh, people may or may not be aware uh, in this last year, there was 166 ballot questions between April and November asked for referendums. 133 of those 166 passed, 80.1% pass ratio. One of the things that jumps out at me that I hope other people reflect on is that is, is an example of data to show that the way we fund public education is, is not meeting the demand of the public education needs. And so it's then going back to each of the locals to try to make up that difference. Um, so as we move into uh, a, a two-year budget cycle from the state, um, I'll be working with you, the board, to identify who our representatives are and how we can communicate with them some of the needs that we have. Um, had an opportunity to attend a couple of neat events. Uh, one was the Future Phoenix, which is our elementary students from both our elementary schools going to UWGB. And the students learning a little bit about what it takes to prepare themselves for educational opportunities after high school, as well as some of our high school students had a chance to go to UWGB as well as um, NWTC. And it's another great example of um, the work that's being done by our staff to create opportunities for our students. Um, I was not only there as to build my capacity, but they need somebody to drive the bus. So <laughs> that showed itself. Uh, did some Alice training with some of our, our staff across the district. Wanted to share out my appreciation with uh, Officer Keith Fisher of the Oconto Falls um, Police Department. Keith continues to provide that training for our staff. And we greatly appreciate that. Also had a chance to work with um, Detective Jamie Kuhn. Um, she, she was unable to be there because of some other responsibilities that same day, but Jamie is also somebody that we appreciate as we work with her on our safety plans. Um, Veterans Day programming. We wanna make sure that we thank all of our staff, our students, um, our veterans and all the supporters that took place, uh, took part in creating the, the activities this last week. Uh, you're probably aware we had Six through 12th grade students um, involved in uh, the Oconto Falls High School Veterans Activity. And then we also had both of our elementaries came together at, at OFIS for another veterans opportunity. And the veterans are extremely appreciative, which is shown by how many show up each year. Uh, the numbers this year was more than I've ever seen in the last eight. And so um, very well attended and very much appreciated. And we always think about the veterans and then something that I put out to folks is we're very thankful to their families. Uh, quite often 
people, we think about those folks that are actually in the role, but quite often it's as hard, if not harder on their families because they leave those people behind and those folks have to carry on with all the same family tasks, but without that veteran there to do their portion of it, not to mention the worry that they go through. So um, we here in O'Connell Falls and in the communities that we support, in my opinion, do a fantastic job of this. And I don't want it to be taken for granted because I've been other places and this is just something that's really neat. So thank you for that. Um, that concludes the, the month in review portion. Uh, the next piece is to take a look at the transportation update. Um, we continue to still be shorthanded. We need 18 regular drivers. Uh, currently we have 16 regular drivers. Um, one of our folks is out on medical leave right now. We're able to continue meeting the demand because we have three subs. So is that seven? 17 with that one so we have six we have 16 people and we would be at 17 if she wasn't on medical okay so we're one short all the time we're two short right now due to the medical but we have three active sub drivers and so we're able to make our mornings um, but as you can imagine if we have more than one person be sick then we're outside of our sub drivers um we do have uh, one individual right now that is actively involved in our training process. Um, and we are hopeful we'll be able to finish her CDL. We have two people that have shown interest. At this point, they're studying, needing to take the written portion before we can get them doing the on the road training. So we have a couple people that are in the system, um, but we still need more folks stepping forward. So at this point, we're not able to make any change away from the one mile restriction that we currently have. And again, it, it's not just about the regular routes. We also need folks for all of those evening events and field trips that occur. Any questions on the trans update? How long would that person be on medical? Um, right now, it's uh, at least a few more weeks is what we know, but they have to, before anybody can come back, they have to be uh, receive a release from a physician that they're ready to go. So sometimes what starts out as a couple of weeks can go beyond that. It's totally dependent on the medical. But that's, that's the current outlook. Oh, current is a couple of weeks. Yeah. Okay. Um, taking a look at the next piece then is 2022 State Educational <coughs> Convention. Uh, this takes place January 18th to the 22nd, or 18th to the 20th. And just trying to determine if anyone from the board has an interest in participating in that. And if you do, if you can please let Debbie know before you leave this evening so that she can identify those folks and um, determine housing for you. What then, days are those or what? I mean, I know the dates, but Wednesday through Friday, Wednesday through Friday. there's actually some activities going on late on Tuesday afternoon as part of the pre convention. Normally, you would go down late Tuesday because right away on Wednesday morning is when it starts. Okay. Um, the other piece is, is identification of a representative from this board. So normally, you have one person from the board that represents the district as part of the delegate. Thank you, as a delegate. Um, if it turns out that we don't have anybody attending, then we'll just have to make that known to your folks that coordinate. Okay. And for those who are wondering, the delegate piece is where uh, various proposed policies and uh, business through WSB get discussed in a very formal uh, matter and manner. So it's a good thing to do. And that concludes my report. Unless you have any questions, I don't think so. Um, Debbie, I'll I gotta determine whether or not. But I've got work wise, and I'm not going to know here for a little bit. When when's kind of latest that we can submit, or any board members can uh, say? We had like an early bird special for registration. We missed that window, anyways. At this point, it's just trying to find the rooms and the housing and stuff like that. They usually go. Everyone starts up the rooms, and then as people don't go, they kind of start releasing. So okay, the delegate the delegate piece. I think we have to do like within the next week or so. Yeah, because then they start sending that person the um, mm -hmm. policies and the revisions that they want you to talk about in December so that that delegate's ready to speak on behalf of your district in January. Okay. So uh, I would, if we can get something even by the end of the week or right after the Thanksgiving, that probably would be. Okay. That's Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Old business.
donations. So you have a list of donations in your packet that we're hopeful that you will consider accepting. <clears throat> I would move that we accept the uh, the donations and thank the donators for for them. Okay. Motion by Ken. Second. Second by Chad. Any other discussion? Ken, thank you. Thank you to the uh, the individuals for the donations. Fantastic. Um, do vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Policy revisions. Last month, and I guess I'll, since I was reporting last month, I'll dig back in, if that's okay, Phil. Mm -hmm. Okay, so last month, <coughs> the revisions passed the uh, first reading, and we're looking for a, an approval of second reading. There were, um, I had one question that came to me, and it had to do with one of the policies and the parental rights for um, getting information from students. I think it was oh, 30... Uh, was in the 3000s. It was it happened to be in the technical section. Um, that particular policy, though, um, the wording that was left out at the end, it seemed like it was going to take a lot of stuff out, but that's in a different policy. And I have it earmarked here, and I'll tell you which one it was. It was 24 policy 2416 student privacy and parental access to information. The question I had was right at the end, there was a whole paragraph that was lined out, but that particular wording is contained in a different policy now, 5780 is the policy where that wording is contained. Okay. Um, so that was one thing. There was one thing that was that came up as a question last month and it had to do with Neola, the contractor who takes care of this um, policy updates for us and, and wording, um, the, the he slash she wording in policies throughout has, is morphing to being a they and them in some instances, or it might just sometimes say students or parents or whatever, it'll have that kind of wording. And there was a question about if we, <clears throat> were there any legalities if we left it one way or the other and the OLA sure us that no, it was okay either way. The policy committee did have a quick uh, conference a week ago and the, after talking about it, the policy committee uh, recommends that we go with the changes that Neola has made so that we're not always finding differences that we have to track over the years and, and keep revising different than what they supply to us. Uh, did anybody else from the board have other questions? Mm, I don't think so. Ken? I'd move that we approve the second reading of uh, the policy uh, updates 31 2 technical corrections and 32 2 update. No second. I'll second. Motion by Ken, second by Adam. Any other questions or discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Little Swamico land lease bids. So at the last board meeting, a potential lease was brought to the board. Um, you had shared an interest in uh, putting out a bid to ensure transparency, to determine what the market rate would provide for <coughs> that property. Um, so the action was taken after that board meeting to post it and it was posted until this last Friday um, because Friday was a holiday, Veterans Day happening. We actually um, held off until today with today's mail. Um, there were no bids that came forward. And so without any bids that have come forward through that process, um, I would ask the board to again, consider what had been brought forward from Peter's Grain Farms um, to continue leasing that property. And that would be at the $500 annual payment amount. I still think it, I mean, I have no problem having a signed contract, but I mean, in my eyes that 
plan is going for $150, $180 an acre. I mean, I'll settle $100 an acre. Yeah. I make the motion that we approve the uh, contract with Mr. Peters. Motion by Jan. Second. Second by Ken. We can open it up for yeah, dis discussion. Open up for discussion. Uh, if you want to, Chad, as the, Chad gives the thoughts, the, the, the value of any piece of uh, property or any contractor, or whatever, is based on what a willing uh, buyer or bidder is re is willing to bid, and what the uh, uh, the owner is uh, willing to accept. And so we can't really compare this with other values. There, you know, there's some extenuating circumstances here, but I think it's. Uh, it, it has worked. <clears throat> um, Peter's Grain Farm is actually doing us a service by maintaining that land. Um, you know, we, it, it, if, if nobody else would be willing to, to accept uh, a rental agreement at, at any price, we'd be uh, probably uh, investing money in maintaining that land. So I think this is in the best interest of the district to accept this uh, um, contract and, uh, and thank Peters for continuing to, uh, to operate the land for us. Mm -hmm. How long do we have it out there? Open bid, two weeks, a month? Mm -hmm. uh, it sends it right after the last meeting I posted with the newspaper, so pretty close to a month, three weeks. <clears throat> and it's a two year? Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there is there, why did we end up purchase that land? Like, that this was an, an existing me. school. For what? This was the, that was an existing school for many years. That's the most wonderful school of property. Yeah, the school was raised. I, yeah, the school I got rid of apparently, and we so we still own the land, and it's yeah. not something that we necessarily, I mean, who knows whether or not we may ever, in the future, was, there's probably not a need to need to sell it at this point. At the time, the at the time there was thoughts that at some point in the future we may need another elementary school down in that part of the district, and so it was felt that it needed to be hung on to at that mm -hmm. point. Yeah, uh, I'll just say I'm, I'm more comfortable with it now, seeing that the transparency was out there. We gave opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, I think without that, I was more hesitant, but at least we can say us as a board, we, we laid it out to the public. That's that's my that's my take as well. I think before, had we just moved forward, I don't think that was, I think we offered it up there, if they're willing to still do it at, at that price. You know, there was an opportunity and, and if other parties are interested and didn't see it that month, guess what, that lease is due in two years and we can, we can put it back out there again, so. Um, thank you for posting it, and and I know it added a little bit of little bit of work to do it, but again, I think we're being above board by doing it this way. Um, so, unless anyone else has any other discussion, can do a roll call vote on that. You want to? Please, I don't. Know. You can. You want to do a roll call? Can I do a request a roll call just because we did yeah, it last time? That's fine. All right. Bear with me. Go ahead, whenever you're ready. Yep. Okay, so, um, Baumler. Yes. Early. No. Schindel. Yes. Carter. Yes. Adler. Yes. Strands. Yes. Gardner. Yes. 6-1. Six, 6-1. One. Six, one. Okay. On the new business, capital referendum results. So a couple different things. wanted to... Um, just share with people our appreciation on, on Tuesday. Uh, the referendum question of the Balfour and Compel School District was was approved uh, by majority of voters, and obviously we want to thank our, our communities for their support. Uh, at this point, we're going to be able to move forward with projects um, that were identified 
in the process of planning this, one being a new middle school on the 90 plus acre property um, adjacent to a Confalls Elementary and High School, and other secure entrances at each of the buildings, and repairing roofs on the buildings. Um, incredibly grateful for that community support. We know that not everybody voted in favor of, of the question on the ballot, but regardless of the decision, we appreciate the engagement process in the conversations that we had and how this will positively impact the future of our schools. Um, we're going to continue to share information with the communities that we serve relative to these projects so that people can be part of the planning process and can also maintain their understanding of what's going on. Um, one of the pieces was a, a timeline that was in your packet to give you some idea. Um, the next six to eight months will be a planning process, at which point they'll start breaking ground. You can see in there um, the intent is to try to, by August of 25, have a, a new middle school that you're moving students into. Um, to get this thing rolling, uh, as you can imagine, there has been quite a bit of conversation um, from the fiduciary standpoint. Kim is going to walk you through some of what is coming here in the next few weeks. So as a board of education, uh, we asked Debbie to reach out to try to schedule something. I think we have it on the books for December 5th right now for a special board meeting. Um, and at that time, you're going to receive information from um, Baird Financial as well as um, PMA. And Kim's going to kind of give you an overview of that tonight so that you kind of have a little bit of an understanding of um, some of the groundwork that has been laid in order to make sure that our, our school district is, is well represented throughout this process um, and to try to front load a little bit of what's going to happen on December 5th. So again, I'm going to hand it to you. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so again, this is going to be very high level uh, just to give you an overview of what's going to be happening over the next few months. Um, the district will secure financing um, by selling bonds, so our district bonds, and to investors in the marketplace. It's not like going to the bank and getting a loan. We actually have to go through this bid process and sell our bonds and investors that would want to buy them. Um, so there are um, different players that we need to have these service providers help us in order to uh, secure $37.6 million. So we just started all these discussions this past week, um, and uh, Baird and PMA both are going to be working from the financial perspective and they're going to come December 5th and give you much uh, more in-depth uh, information. So what I'm going to give you here tonight is just really high level. So it's important to know uh, who these players are. These are the top companies that school districts use. Um, I've talked to a lot of other school districts. They're using these same uh, companies to help us with these services. Baird has been helping us for years with our financing, um, with determining, you know, how much the school district's getting in and operating, but then also helping us plan for our capital needs. So in this um, role, they'll be the underwriters. So they're actually the ones that uh, prepare the debt. We have to create a bid statement that goes out to ask people to want to bid and invest in us. Um, they put that in, out to the marketplace and they get investors to want to bid, but the thing to note about Baird is they are a fiduciary to the investors, not to the district. So what that means is they're responsible um, to make sure that the investor gets the best investment that they can get, not that the district gets the best rate. So this is why PMA comes in. PMA, we've just... Um, you have taken action to allow us to invest with PMA, with um, with our OPEB, and then also with some of our uh, monies that we have that we don't need to use right at the moment. And um, what they would do is really be our financial advisor. Here it says municipal advisor. Um, they'll be our fiduciary to ensure we are getting the best options the market has to offer. Um, so they monitor everything that Baird does and make sure and negotiates that the rate interest rates we're getting, the structure that they're using, and how we're going to get it is um, the best. And both of these companies are market experts. You know, I know enough, but I don't. I'm not living that world every day like they are. So that's why um, we really need their help to do that. 
the next two companies would be Briggs. They are a bond council. We've used them for all of our other referendums. They prepare the legal documentation, the resolutions that you approve, um, any and all legal paperwork, basically, is what they're doing. And then finally, in conjunction with Briggs as our um, legal counsel, our bond counsel, is Quarles and Brady. So what the bond counsel does not provide is a legal opinion that our documents were materially accurate. So that we didn't, when we're going out to bid and we're asking somebody to invest in us and we say our fund balance is this and um, we've been able to save money away in fund 46, all these statements that we're making to make people want to invest in us. Um, this uh, disclosure council is confirming that what we're stating is accurate Otherwise, um, it's very important to do this to protect the district from lawsuits where people would say you didn't omit or you didn't tell us everything you're supposed to tell us. And also to ensure we comply with the SEC, the um, Securities Anti-Fraud Provision Laws. So there, there's a lot that goes on with that. And basically, it's, it's just another check to make sure that the district um, doesn't put itself in a position that we don't want to be in. One of the things that I would bring up in this spot is the work that the district has done and that you and the board have been involved in for the last seven years is going to put the district in a better spot related to um, what you're able to get for bond ratings. So back when we were at a 3% fund balance versus the fund balance we're at today, back when we didn't have a fund 46 versus the fund 46 that we have today, you're going to have people that are more willing to give a little bit better interest rate to purchase that bond than what we would have gotten probably six years ago. So I just want to bring that up that your your work is going to be helpful now as this goes forward. And all these companies are really going to help us, you know, maximize to the best of whatever ability that we and hopefully lower the interest rates or have a better bond rating to help us achieve some of that. Um, this is a question that everyone wants to know, what are the interest rates doing? As we know, um, the interest rates are increasing. Uh, the timeline that I'll go over next, really we would lock in those interest rates long term in January and they are expecting those rates to be 4.65 to 4.7 percent with some future uh, rate hikes that are coming. The original planning estimate and what we've used to uh, talk about the mill rate uh, throughout the referendum was using a 5% rate. So we're still within that range um, that we have been planning for. Um, so that's good news. Um, but you can see the trends. I think this goes back to 1992 and up to 2022. That little box in the upper right corner, that's just over the past year or since you know the interest rates were low. Um, so it's sitting at around 4% now. Next slide. Um, so just a second though. So on that, I mean, it, it kind of shows that, you tell me if I'm wrong, it, assuming we lock in in January and it's somewhere in that sort of sort of range, um, you know, it's not like we're at, not, we're not at like a 30 year highs or anything like that. I mean, we're kind of at almost the average of what it has been for yeah, that's a, a little bit average. higher. But, Four percent. Four percent is twenty-year average. Yes. Yep. So, and we're projecting. What did you say? Or what is it right now? For um, I think it's in the low fours right now, and they're projecting four point six five to four point seven. Okay. So not quite five. We planned at five. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Okay, this slide is hard to read. There's a lot of information on there, but basically um, this is the amortization schedule or repayment schedule that we would um, propose. It's an estimate. Um, this would happen in multiple phases. Phase one, to borrow $37.63 million in a bond anticipation note. And there's a lot of rules um, that when they come here December 5th, they're going to get really into that level of detail. I'm not here to do that tonight, but we levied on the levy that was just approved in October um, and then solidified once the vote happened an amount to repay debt. So we needed to have 
we need to have the bond anticipation you know, within this fiscal year in order to be able to do that. Okay, so that's one. Um, but we can invest that money that we get for construction costs. We can help hopefully curb inflation, you know, get ahead of some of that. And also, if we receive a bunch of interest on the borrowing, we can pay down debt. Then in January, when we lock in the rates, um, which would be for the March 1st date. So March 1st is kind of a magic debt date for a school district. So school district can only borrow for 20 years, um, not longer than that. And March 1st is always the debt payment date. So we're trying to capture that March 1st date. So that would be March of 2023. And then the last payment would be March of 2043. So that's 20 years. So that we would lock in that rate and then actually close on March 1st to start that 20 year clock. Uh, ticking and then that would be your long-term note now that's a few months away and what if the interest rate just goes crazy in that time we we would lock in but we would have the opportunity in the future to refinance and the school district has done that in the past hopefully as projections and what we're seeing we can stay within that five percent mm -hmm. range um, so this slide shows and you have this here it shows what our principal and the interest would be over time. This um, slide does take into account just those factors and how they impact our mill rate. But again, I plugged it back into our model and from all the budgeting and forecasting that we've done, uh, we still are showing to stay within that 9.75 mill rate um, with the information that we have today. Now, we don't know what property values in the area are going to do and, and what the state is going to give us for aid in the future. But from all projections right now, it, it's still um, what we've been talking about. Next slide. This is the timeline. Um, so tonight I'm just giving you a high level overview. <clears throat> then um, on Monday, December 5th, there will be a special board meeting. At that board meeting, we will ask you board to take action to adopt the bond anticipation notes so that we can do the this, this short-term borrowing to get us to that January lock-in date, then to March. Um, and then also there's what's called a parameters resolution. And what that does is it gives the board president and the board clerk, um, the board gives you the right to lock into an interest rate on a certain date. Why that's important is we saw that when we just did our short-term borrowing, we were stuck to that day and there weren't that many investors in the market and the interest rate that particular day was terrible, right? So when we have to wait for a board meeting, that's what we'll get. So that gives a lot of flexibility to hopefully really capture the lowest rate we possibly can get. Um, so that resolution will be brought forth. Um, on December 5th. And the reason why we're doing that special board meeting on December 5th is really um, to have PMA and Baird come here. Um, the timing that revolves around that March 1st date, you know, to figure out how we can get the bid out to market and, and do that. So all this is gonna kind of happen really fast and to get that bond anticipation note yet in calendar year 2022 and get our credit rating done. <clears throat> so the December 5th is an important date. So in January, uh, we'll be working on the bond rating. The Disclosure Council will be confirming that what we're making statement is accurate. We'll be getting our bond rating, um, marketing those bonds at that time. And then there'll be a date where we lock it in. Again, board president and board clerk can lock in on on a date when they tell us it's time to go. And that brings us to March 1st for March 1st, 2023 to close on the bonds. And then we will pay off that bond anticipation note same day. And then a year from now, year from March will be our first payments. Any questions on timing? Okay, this last slide. <clears throat> It's just to kind of give flavor of the complexity of this and, and some of the stuff that Baird and PMA are going to come in and 
share with you is there's what's called a bank qualified bond and a non-bank qualified bond. And when this happens, uh, if a bank bids and is the investor, they can get some tax credits or savings there. So then that can give us even a lower interest rate. Right now they're projecting a 25 or 35 basis point where we could get even a lower rate. And the point of showing you this tonight is that between Baird and PMA, they're going to be working really hard on our behalf to get every concession that they can to help us. That changes all the time. <clears throat> so we don't know where that's going to be. So don't count on 25 basis points. It could be more, it could be less. It's, again, it changes day by day, and that's why it's so important to have the flexibility of, of somebody to be able to take a trigger on an interest rate. Mm -hmm. So that's really just high level, the process, the plan, know that we have experts in place and they're gonna come and give you a lot more information. Any questions? I think so. Okay, thank, thank, you. thank you. Thanks, Kim. You'll be here on that December 5th meeting to interpret what they tell us. <laughs> yes, we <for> shall. Sure. <laughs> yeah, so no, no action needed. <coughs> and, uh, okay. Um, 2324 high school course revisions. I just have one question. I see on this uh, from Nexus the roof. I see roofs for Abrams and I see roofs for Lucas. There's nothing on the high school. So if you remember back, the high school process, um, there was two different options and we chose to move forward with the lower of the two. Um, one was to actually replace the roof and the other one was to have the roof certified. And so ultimately what they're willing to do is to come in and certify the roof to give us X number of years. Um, and then if there's a problem within that time frame, then what we're paying for is them to come back and, and fix the roof as needed. So. All right, uh, course revisions. Um, and I can, so uh, prior to the regular meeting, we did have a curriculum committee meeting um, where Dan and, uh, and, and uh, a few staff sat through, went through the, the, the course offering updates. Dan's gonna just kind of give us a quick preview. Um, overall, the committee was pleased with the um, the recommendations and um, so Dan. Thanks. So um, relatively few changes in the course book um, from uh, this year to next year. There was one new course proposed for next year. It's a computer science principles course that would be um, taught by um, someone in the math department that has earned her computer science. Um, certification, which is pretty rare certification to get. Um, the thinking is, or the, the proposed plan is to offer this introductory course and gauge student interest, and then maybe pair it with an advanced course on a rotating basis every other year. And so computer science is something that had been a part of the course guide in prior years, a number of years ago, um, as our enrollment declined and some of our staffing um, was reduced, um, that, that course had to be given up, but um, we think it might be a nice offering for our students. Um, other than that, um, I've organized in the updates um, kind of how the book looks different from, from, um, from this year. And basically, some of it is um, planned rotations of courses in order to offer our students more um, variety of courses. We're trying to put many of them on a rotation that students can plan for. So they'll know that I can get this course in the department in the upcoming year. It won't be available the following year, but then it will be available the year after, and then they can do some planning. And so I listed um, those courses where we're doing that. For example, science is a good example. Um, this year we're teaching advanced placement biology. Next year we won't teach that, but we'll teach uh, another dual credit course, UWGB human biology. And then the following year we'll go back to AP biology. And that way students that really want that 
that rigorous science experience can, can plan for that accordingly. So the more we're able to do that with courses, um, just the better students can plan and the wider variety of offerings we have. Then the third category would be courses that we're not planning to run next year. We didn't take them completely out of the course book, but we have just a notation that we're not planning to run it. Um, those are courses that um, have had, they may not have run for a number of years or they have had very low enrollments. And so, um, you know, we've listed those courses. We, we simply don't have the staffing to be able to teach them. And just based on the numbers over the years, um, very few students have requested them. Um, they could very likely find their way out of the course book eventually, but we're leaving them in there as departments continue to talk about, you know, what should we keep in there and, and kind of how that's going to stay fresh and, and viable for students. So we have a number of those courses. Many of them have not run for years just because of the one moment. And then the last, um, last category would be a few courses that were eliminated from the course guide. Um, one of them is a, a course in the music department, concert choir, which had been one of four courses to teach choir to students um, that had been um, typically taught by ninth, or um, taken by ninth grade students. There was a ninth grade choir and a tenth grade choir. Our choir teacher has felt like combining them would be best for that group, and so um, in the number of support being able to do that. So instead of having four choirs, it would be three. Um, and then there's um, some other business courses that um, have had really low numbers. And we're looking at, in particular, the video production courses that that's bounced around between the ELA department and this business department. Um, the teacher that really championed it years ago is long, no longer with us, and the curriculum needs some work. And so, you know, we've had some discussion about maybe morphing that into a video journalism. <coughs> because we've also lost the journalism class in LA. Um, so those those would no longer be a part of the book or almost some other low enrollment um, courses. So those are um, those are the ways the book will look different. But I just also like to point out if you look at page 58 of the, the larger guide, um, we talk about some other course opportunities that are not taught necessarily by Oconto Falls High School staff. And we have a number of different virtual options for students. There are options for early college credit um, at our university system in Wisconsin. We have opportunities in the Start College Now through our technical colleges. And so um, there are really opportunities for students that have a well thought out career path and they have, um, you know, kind of a direction and they're looking for some courses, they have the opportunity to take those things. And I shared a little bit of that with the curriculum committee, um, planning on giving that report to the full board later this year so you can really see some of those other things that students are doing. So that's what we're proposing to offer to our students. We would look at um, having our students getting the course materials out to them in December. And then in January, we're planning to have a meeting for eighth grade parents and students to come in and learn a little bit about some of the elect elective areas in particular, and then really start having students select their courses in January, with the goal being master schedule completed by May. So any questions on anything in the course guide? Looks mm -hmm. good. So we need a in a motion to uh, accept the course revisions, and I would maybe recommend someone on the curriculum. Committee. I'll make that motion. Motion by Adam. I'll second it. Second by Brian. Any other questions? Thank you to the curriculum committee and Mr. Moore and yeah. the staff to come up with this. I think it's good for kids to have these things happen. I think this is what we're about. This is where school. I love hearing about curriculum. Yeah, and we, when we discussed it, we'd met last year, the year prior, and there was clearly some things that were in the hand, handbook or in the, the course descriptions that needed to be removed. And there was a lot of heavy lifting last time. This mm -hmm. time you saw only one, one edition and really not any major, major moves. So um, overall, appreciate the discussion we had on it. Okay. We will vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried.
Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. A youth risk behavior survey. <clears throat> so Ms. Terry Olson is going to share information with you, the board. As you remember, uh, this is something that has come up in the past. Um, and you as a board wanted to gather more information as to how is this information used um, and a little bit about the process. So yeah, and I've got Jane Schneider, our middle school um, school counselor with us. Um, Jane's done the survey. You wouldn't know it, but a lot longer than me for sure. So, um, so we are going to talk, um, and we've got some slides and some information to share about how we administer the youth risk behavior survey. Um, and I thought I would start out first by um, we've administered this survey um, since 2010, um, 2008, I think 2008. It's a survey that's been designed um, and kind of gone through some tweaks through DPI. Um, it used to be I think it's typically been about every other year that the survey gets administered. There used to be some different ways that it was administered. I would say for the last five or six years, it's been pretty standardized in terms of how it's used. Um, so the policy that's guided us collecting this information is the policy policy that um, Jan referenced today um, in terms of revisions. It's the 2416 um, student privacy and parental access. And, and just the, the gist of this policy um, is that it guides us in gathering the information in this type of survey. Um, and, and the guides are that no students required to participate in this survey. Um, parents have the opportunity to inspect the survey materials. Um, parents can opt their child out of the activity and that the data is summarized, not making any connections with individual students or small groups of students. So this, this policy has been in place and these guidelines aren't anything that's been changed. Um, with the decision that was made today. Any questions about that, the policy at all, or this, it's not a new policy, it's something that we've been using to help guide this work um, for years. So I pulled um, some data from, these are our participation rates um, from the past, and, and I just pulled the data that we had. Of course, COVID, there was a kind of a gap in the in goofy administration. Hopefully we're gonna be back on track with um, kind of a winter spring administration, they call it, every other year in odd number of years. Um, so 16, 17 data, middle school had 83%, high school had 81% student participation, um, 18, 19, um, a little bit higher in that year. And then 2021, 20, um, so our last administration, we had 79% of our middle school students and 52% of our high school students. Um, so when pupil services, um, and then Mr. Solaric as our health teacher, we, we sat down to look at the data and, um, you know, when we looked at the data, we tried to compare some rates of things like how, how is our student anxiety? Is it higher? Are students reporting anxiety higher now than before? Um, when we look at that information, um, that participation rate drop um, kind of is always in that in our minds when we're looking at the data. So um, we're hoping that we can kind of share with, with you all um, as the board and, and then We've always shared the information with parents, um, but there's been some maybe misunderstandings or, or differences in thinking of collecting this survey and using this survey. So but I just thought I'd share with you the participation rates. Um, and the next part, we're going to talk about some of the ways that we use the data. Um, this is a source of data that, you know, we've got lots of academic data, we've got lots of achievement data, we've got forward testing, we've got benchmark testing, we've got lots of testing. Um, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, the YRBS, has been our survey, or has been our data source um, for students um, kind of in that social emotional area, health, healthy living, healthy, you know, protective factors. So I'll let Jane talk about how she's used the survey before. She's really um, quite an expert in, in the survey, so. Well, I started using the survey um, in 2008, I think it was. Um, it was about 2006 we started writing for the state AODA grant. Um, it was, I think back then it was like a three-year grant. And when you write for grants, you have to um, use as much data as you can. Um, the the first few grants were really focused on developing character education um, and when we looked at the data from the YRBS, uh, we, you know, before we write the, the, the next grants, 
Uh, we look to see what is it that we need to, you know, really focus on with the students um, as far as like mental health or um, academic um, support. And the last probably 10, 15 years, we really focused on um, providing students with academic support, especially after school, because um, some of the data indicated that uh, like students who were um, reporting that they had suicidal ideation or um, had um, tried, you know, committing suicide also were correlated with the students who were um, self-reporting that they were, you know, getting Ds and Fs in class. So, um, you know, we use data from the county, um, economic, socioeconomic um, data. Uh, back when we had the WKCE, we used data from, from those. Um, numbers. So it really just kind of depends on um, what the surveys are indicating and then we draw from that and you know we we'll put together the grants is, um, based on what the students needed the most. One of the things I'm going to jump in, we use a lot of acronyms in education and so AODA, alcohol and other drug abuse um, concerns or grants related to that. So the other thing is the YRBS is Youth Risk Behavior yes. Survey, mm -hmm. um, and you know WKCE Wisconsin Knowledge and Concepts <laughs> exam. The forward is another <laughs> academic exam. So we apologize for all the acronyms, but in a nutshell, they're they're talking about the fact that for us to move forward and meet the needs of our students, we need to have something to identify what are the needs of our students, other than our anecdotal observations, and we don't have a lot of other things that we can fall upon the way we do academically. There are a lot of different assessments and things that we do from an academic standpoint, but from this standpoint, the YRBS is really kind of a main provider of that information outside of our anecdotals. And I really appreciate because that use of the YRBS enabled the middle school to get that AODA, alcohol and other drug abuse yeah. grant for how many years? Probably 10 or 12. Oh. Um, almost. Well, 20 years, almost 20 years, I'd say, or, you know, close to that, but provided a lot of funding so that we could have, you know, leadership training for kids. They went to Camp Unalaya. We had parenting programs, evidence-based, um, strengthening family programs, too. You know, we um, collaborated with the county with a lot of programs. Um, I mean, the, the list is really endless as to what, you know, the grant provided um, that we wouldn't have been able to offer if we didn't have that data and, you know, it's right for the grant. So um, it's really important to be able to use, you know, to, to have the students take this. Um, also, the, you know, the state, it's a state Wisconsin YRBS and we're able to you know see where we are as far as um, in the county because all the other schools are taking it as well so we got together with I um, can't remember what the coalition was but you know to analyze the data with the schools in the in Ocano County to see where where we all were as far as you know all the different um, questions that were asked and so it was really interesting i mean that you know helps as well um and i there's connections um school, school connectedness is connectedness for students is a protective factor the more connected a student can be to a, to um to their school to someone in their school to an adult is is a protective factor that um you know is a is a a part of the a piece of some of the information and data that's collected from the YRBS, but um, I know the middle school had done a connections activity in the last couple of years. Our high school is doing a connect, is kind of in the process of doing that connection, connection activity this year. Um, Office, you know, and Abram, like there's all of our schools have kind of picked that as an area um, that, that they're um, focusing on. And, and I say the elementary schools because, you know, we don't do a YRBS with elementary, it starts at grade six um, statewide. So, 
However, we know that connectedness or protective factors or risk factors, you know, start much earlier than that for students. So, um, so those schools have been looking at that, you know, how they can also increase, you know, modify programming to support students. Um, if you have anything else to add, Jean, feel free to go on. And I, um, high school, um, I wanted to just highlight some, and Mr. Smith is here too. If he wants to add anything, you can add. <laughs> um, I realize I put health department, but I don't mean like county health department. Like our health department, meaning Mr. Solaric and Mr. Lukey, um, they both taught health in the past. This year, it's Mr. Solaric, um, who's doing all of our health. Um, so they uh, will look at this data um, because the data collected also looks at healthy behaviors. It looks at drug use, alcohol use, sleep, eating, exercise. It looks at kind of a variety of health um, factors and health behaviors. So they can kind of look at that because that's really what your curriculum helps support universally for all students is um, healthy living and how you can try to be healthy or if you're not or stay healthy if you are. Um, we've used this data um, at the high school when we started partnering with Bellin Health um, for our school-based mental health services. Um, you know, it wasn't a grant, it was more of a partnership, but you know, they, they ask about they asked years ago about our YRBS data and, and why we needed. Um, and student anxiety is typically a factor in, in our number and our students who report feeling depressed um, over you know a su substantial amount of time. There's there's some pieces in that YRBS that have kind of helped us be able to communicate to some of those partners the needs that we have. Um, I'm hoping that we can use it to track our implementation of the team mental health first aid. We're, putting a lot into that, starting that process this year, and that's really going to be multi-year. Um, this is really the first year that all of our health students um, will be having that curriculum and be certified in that, so um, hopefully it will give us a way to track over time. Um, and then the, the quantitative support is, you know, again, this is just a piece of data that we can that we can go to with SEL, social emotional learning, um, that, that we can do comparisons from year to year. We can do comparisons for other um, local communities, um, O'Connell County does give does put together a report, um, and that gets reported on you can go on DPI's website and find O'Connell County's um, data for the YRBS. Um, so it just gives some, you know, mental health. Oftentimes, is you know, it, it's it's about things that are a little bit harder to track down than than achievement. Um, so, but this is this is a really strong survey that has been used for many years um, to at least to give us that. To give us a give us data in, in an area that can be a little bit less, a little slippery or a little harder to, to get a handle on. So, um, and then just another couple more uses um, district wide. Um, O'Connell County, like like Jane said, um, kind of partnering to see what preventative programming they can they can offer. <coughs> they will use the YRBS data. Um, there's her, it's HRSA the HRSA grant. Um, HSHS St. Clair used the countywide data to. Um, they have gave a multi-million dollar grant, um, and one of the work groups in that grant is prevention, and that's a group that I've sat on for um, a couple of years, and that's where kind of my passion and, and really understanding of the youth mental health first aid and teen mental health first aid came from, and they're also funding some of that. Like, they've got trainers that can come in and do that. Um, so that data for our county was was needed. Um, again, we, we've kind of been knocking on doors to get more school-based mental health services. Um, so it help, it just gives us a data source. Um, we used we used our actual YRBS data in that part, in our most recent attempt at a partnership. We're still waiting to hear back on a grant, um, a Cigna grant. Bellin applied for a Cigna grant that we would be a partner on for a community health worker. Um, we should know November, mid November, early December. So if if um, Bellin was able to get that grant, but we we needed again, kind of like Jane said with AODA, you need a data. A data source to kind of justify why, um, you know, back up what you're saying when you're writing a grant. Um, and just to be, you know, we don't get any funding for administering the assessment itself. There's no funding tied from DPI. Um, it's actually, you know, our staff that, that does the work of it. Um, so there's no funding. Um, the only funding that we've gotten has been in applying for grants, um, just to make sure that that was clear because that might have been something that was out there as a, as a misinformation like oh we're getting questions you know we're asking kids these questions and we're getting money as a district we get no money um it's just it's just a service that's offered i will say the reports um you can get really technical into it it will um provide some correlational 
data, which is, is like Jane had talked about, they saw that students were failing grades, or reported having failing grades again. It's, it's a little bit slipperier than actual academic data, but those students um, were also, you know, more at risk for suicide, um, suicidal ideation. So it's, that's how we use it in the past. Um, where we're at right now um, is like November to December, this is prior to the test, DPI just, I think, Jane just forwarded me the email that she got. Jane and Danny coordinate them. Um, Danny coordinates high school, Jane coordinates the middle school, um, YRBS. And so each building would have to register with, with the YRBS. We have to tell them um, which survey will administer. There is a standard survey and then there's additional modules um, that we may or may not, you know, administer. Um, you know, we'll have to talk through before we, before we would register for that. Um, and then we also have to give them a date of administration and a backup date. So we're in a registration period right now where we have to kind of look at, are we, are we going to administer the YRBS? Are we going to do the standard YRBS? Are we going to add any additional modules in there? Um, and I did look today, I was, as I was getting ready for this, I think they've extended it to January. I think January 30th is our um, deadline to register. It was December, so I was kind of freaking out <laughs> a little bit, but, um, and then once once you register, we you know then we follow our policy. Then we you know notify parents of the test date, how they can review the information. Um, letters get sent home at both um, sites. Um, we use we use Skylart to be able to communicate that with parents. The links, I mean, anyone can go to the anyone can go to a link right now and find out what those survey items are. Um, they don't have to wait for that letter. If they have some concerns about it or have questions about it. Um, Another piece that, that might not be clear, but when we administer this test, um, there is a parent, we use passive parent, um, passive consent. So we send home a letter and if a parent says they don't want their child to do the survey, they send it back. And the team will coordinate, like if you know the, any kids that parents don't want them to take the test, we'll do something else during that block of time. Um, and then, um, passive consent. Um, they send that back. Um, we make you know list and um, we know like which kids are not. Yep. Um, I know this. <laughs> That's my trade of thought. Um, um, so we so we have parents can opt out with that with that letter um, that they can sign and say that they don't want them. But but in the administration directions when when you administer the the assessment, what, you know I think Jane does them all at the middle school. Yeah, Most it's um through you know one of the classes each day, like all all the seventh grade math classes, or you know each grade is different. Um, it's in one classroom, so I read a script. It I can't go off the script, so every student is getting the same information. I can't answer any questions. I don't look at their computer. Um, I provide dividers if they want to put dividers on to make it more confidential or anonymous. Um, they, they can opt out of any question they don't feel comfortable answering. Um, so it, it's really... So we have, that's what I was gonna say about the opt out, so we have a parent opt out, but students in those directions that are, students can opt out the day of the test. Students are told within those directions, if you're not comfortable answering any question, you do not have to answer any Like students can have a lot of, you know, autonomy and, and um, opting out as well. So parents clearly can um, within our process, but students can also have, have that autonomy to opt out. Um, and high school does it in homeroom? We do it in homeroom. Um, same thing, the teachers have a script. Students have the option to opt out of the whole test at that point, even if the parent didn't do so, or uh, opt out of certain questions. In um, we, we do it in more of the, I would say, like a Ford exam type setup with people spread out taking it on their Chromebooks. Yeah. And we've got the tech services department is engaged closer to that date of administration to make sure that everything's in place um, for that administration to be confidential for students. Um, there isn't, um, you know, we've tried to make sure that um, that's covered. Because <laughs> I think that, that was a question that came up last year, I believe. Um, yeah. was, was, you know, 
teachers, mm -hmm. you know, can use devices to you know, teachers can use GoGuardian or different different systems to monitor what students are doing. But we make sure that Corey through the tech and the tech department has helped um, make sure and ensure that anything's 100% confidential. So. Um, I did put in here the links for the surveys that would um, be out. So I don't know. Yeah, and they're in their okay. package of separate documents. Mm -hmm. So we have copies of the survey. Thank you. Is do we need? Is there an action required on this? Or? Yeah, we're looking to um, have the board consider allowing us to move forward with the YRBS. Just to be, to be clear, did I hear you say that this is every other year on the odd years? Mm -hmm. So this won't be presented again until 2025. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, it's a little odd because we, we missed a year at COVID, so they did it late. So if you remember, I think it was last spring that we mm -hmm. administered it, but this puts us back on the right rotation. I was so it's a little sooner now than it would normally mm -hmm. be. Right, because I remember when mm -hmm. we talked about this last year. Yeah, so it is. It's every two years, but because of the mess up and and timing, it's coming back quickly. Makes sense. Thanks. I would move that we move forward with this testing with this survey process. Motion by Jan. No second. No second. Second by Kim. Any other discussion? I would say the last time around, the two um, questions about it was confidentiality. There was a lot of parental concern about confidentiality. So I guess as long as you've got IT confirming and court confirming that it's 100% <coughs> confidential. And then the other one was um, enough parent notice that parents are getting the information. The parents can review the surveys. Parents have enough. Mm -hmm. And that's that'd be my concern is just make sure the parents definitely see it and definitely have the opportunity to opt their child out. Mm -hmm. Sure we agree with that. that we'll make sure that that timeline is, you know, and I can come back. I'm kind of, I feel like I'm coming back kind of every other month to talk about mental health. So, um, I mean, I can share that timeline with you kind of when we plan to, when we would plan to administer if we're going to administer and then kind so of give I, you an I, idea of when we get those notices out. So if you do get questions from community members, you know, you're informed with what. Mm -hmm. That administration yeah, I definitely see the, the benefit to it, but I also see some parent, parent concerns that mm -hmm. they may not feel their child is mature enough or they may just feel their child, it isn't right for them. Mm -hmm. So that's, that'd be my biggest concern. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thanks, ladies. Uh, thank thank you. You. Again, we have a <clears throat> motion by Jan, by Jan and a second by Ken. There's discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Appendix B revisions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> the last meeting we brought to you, the board, um, that we have been approached about creating a high school ice fishing team. And we have a, a couple of our advisors. Um, Mr. Ingram and Mr. Allen, I think, are here this evening. Uh, yeah. They're going to share a little bit more information with you about what they're intending before they get rolling. I just wanted to pitch out, we're excited about the opportunity. Um, we talk about uh, how our kids have a fantastic education in Oconto Falls. Um, we're excited about the additional opportunities for learning outside the classroom as well. So this is one more example of that. So. Um, in case you don't remember, please know that we're appreciative of you bringing this forward, and it's, it's exciting. So, yeah, thanks. Um, maybe we'll just start. I don't know what detail that y'all went into last meeting, but this started as a bit of, I guess I'd call it grassroots. Um, had some students kind of here in other schools in the area, and um, just you know, kind of wondering why why can't we do this? Um, so we kind of looked into it, found a state-run organization that WIFA. Um, and kind of from there, knew I knew some friends that uh, had started up a program in Three Lakes. So just kind of was picking their brain also. So that's kind of how, how I got involved and started with this. Um, so kind of. From that, uh, we did have our first meeting last um, 
Well, what was that a couple of weeks ago already? Yeah. yeah. Um, so it was, we announced at the school, had an initial interest meeting, we had 25 kids, uh, students sign up, um, and have our next meeting planned in December, early December. That's kind of our official kickoff, it, it would be. And, uh, and that one, we do have the uh, conservation warning coming in um, to talk with some safety and just general fishing and on the ice uh, regulations and that. Um, so that's kind of catches us up where we are today. Um, from there, uh, we're developing the season dates, um, kind of when we will be active uh, with uh, uh, on the ice or, or training for uh, the tournaments. Ultimately, there's some tournaments through this uh, uh, state program that we're mainly interested in. And uh, this year, Shano Lake is the state state tournament. So it's more of a local local ice for us. Uh, so we see there's a couple, couple weekends or a, a day a weekend uh, starting in January. Uh, since we have 25 interested students, we can see having our own inside school uh, tournament, if you will, our own students uh, competing against each other. This would be all inland, um, inland lakes, uh, no bay activities related to related to these, this team. Um, aside from that, we are addressing some of the safety. Uh, we do have a handbook, a one pager. I, yeah, it looks like it's up on the screen right now. Uh, so a couple of things we've been working with the district on was the safety aspect and and I don't know if I you want me to dive into that then or jump, just some of the jump in okay uh, you, you find in different districts um, have different rules or tolerances on uh, motorized vehicles on the ice by students um, what we as advisors propose is similar to what Bondo Wells is is that ATVs and side-by-side -side snowmobiles are allowed during practices or competitions, assuming the competition allows them. Some, some tournaments go um, to access the fishing spots. No recreational um, riding, racing, obviously things like that. That was another reason we we're having DNR in on December's meeting. So that was a pending uh, something, one with insurance. You know where the liability stood with with that uh, was a question, and then also just our general tolerance um, as a district in um, allowing this activity or allowing students to to use um, all-terrain vehicles and that on the ice if, if deemed safe by the advisor by scouting out the bodies of water ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So that would be probably the. First primary action we were looking for uh, um, approval on, you know, whether that happens now or, or how that happens, I'm not sure. I can um, jump in on this a little bit. So um, we had a kind of a collaboration meeting, you know, between the, the advisors and um, Jerry Monahan, Dan Moore, and myself. And I can't remember if there's anybody else there. Um, but in a nutshell, a couple of different things came up. This was one of them. And I'd actually had a chance to talk to one of the advisors from Bondwell. Um, and you know, as, as was stated, they, they allow the students to utilize sleds and, and UTVs. Um, by sleds, I mean snowmobiles. Um, I'm torn on this one. So from a logistical standpoint, I, it, it would make sense because if you're gonna have 25 students it might be challenging to support all those 25 students with only the advisors or the advisors and the um, chaperones being able to do the the operating of the sleds or the UTVs. On the flip side, I will tell you that it causes me anxiety um, to think about young people on motorized vehicles because uh, it's been a long time since I was a young person, but sometimes I still act that way when I get on a sled or a UTV. Um, and it, it it causes me pause because I'm, to some extent, I'm trying to be thoughtful of setting our advisors up for success. And I, having worked with kids for almost 30 years now, 
there are going to be situations that our advisors will be put in um, if we allow the kids to, to run those. And I would think that most of our young people will make good choices um, regularly. But there, there will be, I would anticipate, some situations where you would then have to step in. And, um, and I'm just I'm concerned about the safety piece. So we didn't reach consensus. Um, we had talked about this as an issue that we thought was going to need to be brought up to you, the board. Um, there's part of me that wants to be supportive again, because I think this is a neat activity for students. And especially we have some kids that this might be one of the few things that they do and really in align with for our activities. Um, so I'm excited that we have people willing to support that. Um, then there's my my overly cautious safety side that says, can we come up with a way to maybe start it out a little bit more controlled and only the adults would be able to utilize them um, in order to take the kids out there and drop off their equipment, things like that, which I know would cause more of a hassle for the adults, but it would be more controlled and contained at that point. So I think one of the other things that came up was um, like a fiscal you know, investment. And I think we had kind of kicked around like $1,200 to begin with to try to help support, you know, getting you guys some of the equipment. We recognize that some of the students won't have their own. And so um, we're hoping that, you know, if the district is able to kick in that. And then if you guys are able to get some, I know Bondwell shared that Eskimo has been very supportive of getting this up and running. Um, I meant to send you that email. I'll follow up with that. But in case I forget, Eskimo has been very supportive for that other district. Um, so those were two things. I can't remember if there was anything else that was kind of a sticking point for conversation. Um, those are the two I remember. The the one that somebody had some kickback on is if we could have a little Facebook page. And the only reason I put that in there is if we're going to get donations and that from local businesses, that would be an easy way to promote it, promote it back or advertising back. I don't know the the policy on that. That has to all go through the school, or one of us advisors can run it, or whatever. Or if you don't even want to go that page, go down that road. But okay. That one I haven't thought about yet, so I'll have to get back to you now. Yeah, because if we did that, we'd also probably want to have student pictures, you know, and we need that authorization to yep. allow that. Yep. Going back to the safety part briefly, would there be a consideration of waivers being signed like we do with student athletes? Yeah, I think you guys had something in there about that. Yeah. In, like pertaining specifically to the use of UTVs and snowmobiles where you know you are at risk or the individual would be at risk and not hold the school liable for it. it yeah, I, it, yeah, I don't know what the template is. I'm assuming you just has something. We could come up with something. I think, I think though it is a district sponsored event. And so there is a liability there for the district. Mm -hmm. We checked into the insurance side Insurance is telling us that we would be covered under our liability, um, but they would expect that we would also be being very thoughtful. And they gave us a laundry list, you know, checking depths of ice, you know, looking at how you're going to implement checks and balances on the motorized vehicles. Um, I think one of the things we've talked about is the transportation to and from, making sure that that's part of the, you know, acknowledging that they're taking the responsibility for getting themselves to and from. So insurance just gave us guidelines and those are the things and we have been thoughtful of pretty much each one that they brought up we just didn't come to consensus yet on the the on ice motorized vehicle piece so when you go to tournaments are you having like the whole team like you know big circle or somewhere be over there somewhere yeah. here or over there or yeah. the has their own rules. yeah so they, they have their own rules a lot of them may have boundaries i'll say okay oh all teams have to be within this boundary, you know, they'll show a boundary on the lake. And then they may also, some of them have a requirement of an advisor per certain amount of students. So one advisor per four students or five or something. Mainly, make sure there's no cheating or anything else going on while, while that's all happening out there. So um, I can't say that's for every tournament. I haven't gone through them all, but the few that I've looked at, that's, that's something that I've seen. The one thing too is the, if it's a four man team or 10 man team, and we got obviously 25 kids, we would have to team A, B, C, D, where we'd have to have 
one of us or a chaperone at that point part of that group or that team as they call it for tournament so it would probably be the, on the tournament we signed up for how many of the kids could actually make that saturday and then we'd have to you know yeah. from there but no it's strict and there's at least the tournaments that we looked at that there's a visor that even measures the fish make sure it's put back in the water properly there's no passing around the tent and they all measure and there's a lot of rules in place that it falls back on the advisor of the team well i think you guys figured out that depending on how many adults you have maybe not all the kids can participate in the tournament so it might be a situation that you know it's limited and, and you'll have to come up with a manner to figure out who gets to go okay with ice fishing tournaments the ones that you're talking about and i have a concept of how big shawna lake is but how far from shore would, would the tournament be happening? I I don't have a specific answer to it. I, the, the guidelines for that tournament aren't, aren't out yet. Um, but I, I would assume it's it'll be a ways for sure. So yeah. like more than half a mile. I don't I don't know. I don't know because more than you'd probably want to walk. Or pulling a bunch of ice well, fishing. Well, and I get like, to that, the conditions, and, and how much and snow mid, covered things, too, yeah, or if it's clear it's ice. Or whatever. Yeah. yeah, so I, you don't know the snow cover, things like that. But, and mm -hmm. most of them, too, have like a rules committee the night before, the morning before. And there's a mm -hmm. detailed map of who goes where. Where you can only fish, you can't go fish the east side of the lake, only the west side. And, My point being, though, dealing with safety is minimizing some of that risk might be if there is an opportunity to not use motorized vehicles on the ice kids could pull their equipment out for the most part I, for those yeah, who are able to do that yeah i mean there there'll be opportunities if, if the students want to do it they'll figure it out mm -hmm. um it's it's a matter of how tolerant they'll if it's a uh, the other safety aspect is that how cold it is. You know, obviously it's going to be cold. It's winter. Um, the quicker you get to transport back and forth, sometimes it's also sure. a safety concern. Yeah. So it's kind of trying to balance all that out. Yeah. So it says no full size vehicles driven by students on ice. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, the advisors being adults, I mean, do you have the capacity within your pickup trucks or your vehicles to get? equipment out there in a timely manner just in your own vehicles without having the unit yeah i would expect the majority of time an advisor would have a full-size truck out there you know so there are those opportunities and that's also you got the safety aspect of having a vehicle over there in case something's neat you need to get someone back quick yeah. or their goal was to buy a couple for one of a closed show and everything in, but also then a couple hub shacks where we'd have it warm where if somebody is cold, because several terms are four or five hours where you know, you'd have a spot to warm them back up. Right. Yep. I think it comes down to the accessibility of where the tournaments are, you know, with safety, um, and just what, what liberty we want to give the students for, for this this activity. So is it up to the parents to bring them to that lake or are we or how is that going for transport? So if you have um, how many may, kids. Yeah, main, mainly we'd set up a meet location on shore prior to whatever event and um, tournaments are usually at a boat ramp. That's where you have your meetings and you, you take off from there. Um, our you know school function or just our practices or our own tournaments between all our own students same thing you know we'd set up a meet location okay from here we're gonna head out the ocean where you check them in yeah when we take off and right there it's there so it's there yeah yep. i guess no i'll weigh in a little bit i i understand the the desire to remove all risk from anything that's associated with the school also realize the vast majority of our athletes drive to school, drive home after practice. You know, we have good advisors that we are, you know, hand picking or selecting to be to run this. Um, and the reality is these kids are with parents or friends or family are involved with this sort of activity. 
all the time anyways, likely. That's why they show an interest. And I don't, I don't know, you know, of any major incidents that we've had in the student body of kids that have, the, the, the risk is there. And I, I'm appreciative and totally understand that. Um, you know, being an ice fisherman and Adam and others can probably attest to this, right? The, the logistics of getting out there and everything else, if you guys have the right, um, you know, precautions in place, and also that you have, I noticed in your sportsmanship section, you have, you know, flagrant disregard for ice fishing safety. Um, you know, it's kind of in that sportsmanship. Maybe maybe one recommendation would be put something in that safety section, you know, specifically around vehicles or just safety in general. That because it, you know, they have in here suggesting that, you know, uh, a rule violation can cause a member to be removed from the team. And, and basically have a zero, zero tolerance policy on the driving of UTVs. Because I think one is ice conditions concern, you know, is there appropriate ice? And I think you guys are addressing that. And that's that's kind of an easier one. The other one is kids making right and safe choices and not, you know, driving too fast, doing donuts, all that sort of stuff. And that's the sort of thing that advisors can police. So I, I you know, unless proven otherwise by the kids or by the advisors that we need to do something different, my recommendation would be to allow the guys to do what they're asking and, and recommending. So, How long has Bondwell had their team? Four years. I think this will be their fourth year. And they've had it ATVs for that whole time? Yep. I didn't talk in person. All right. He, they, they have for the whole time. Um, and it, it, it is, it's something that is discussed prior to every meet every every tournament it's something that is discussed at length you know is this something even if they're gonna because the ice can it depends on the ice conditions so if if they're going to be allowed on or not it, it kind of changes to, to tournament to tournament then how about equity amongst participants if you have some that have some, some that doesn't have some, or sufficient to know as advisors to know that. It, yeah, it's, you know, I would say it's something we'd have to work out. Um, that's one thing we have to have the conservation warden there is to make sure people know they gotta have taken the training program to operate ATVs and, and that and whatever registrations they need to be out there, you know, so even some of that stuff may even limit you know those that you know might have thought they could but are learning that they they can't you know until they get some some things taken care of so i mean other than that i don't see uh, anyone sharing necessarily uh but that's where the advisors would <clears throat> make sure we're able to get whoever whoever doesn't have it can get out there and i think it'll be quite a few you know i majority probably won't be showing up in trailers with snowmobiles and everything else that, that'd be my Yes. What does that do? Are mainly going to be helping shuttle equipment, you know, for whatever location it might be going to. I, I'm going to venture to say those that are going to be showing up with those UTVs are probably from backgrounds that have good knowledge and use of how to use them from their parents to begin with. So they're going to have a good sense of being smart with them from the beginning. Maybe or maybe not. I'm already that up here. We stress to them right away. This is a privilege that all schools yeah. aren't getting. It. One screw up, it's done. Mm. It's good messaging. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so up to this point, um, as the guys stated, they did a interest meeting to get an idea of how many kids might be interested. They have the next meeting scheduled in hopes that this would go well and you all would um, approve this request. And so at this point, um, we're asking you, the board, if you feel comfortable to consider approving us moving forward with this. Um, and again, I think it's that, that piece with the UTV that we've just talked about or snowmobiles um feeling okay with us doing the twelve hundred dollars towards getting this thing up off the ground and then if this goes well for this first year 
and we could bring this back as a full-fledged appendix B position, uh, paid positions, and and determine what went well and what are things maybe we need to modify. I am going to make that motion to approve um, what has been presented to us as is, which will include the use of um, the ATVs. Just as is, I'll make that motion. Okay. I'll second. second. Arm wrestle. We'll get it to the to Sarah with a with a third by Chad. <laughs> All right. Any other discussion? I was going to ask about fillets, but it sounds like the fish are going back in the hole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll work on that one. <laughs> Practice. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, guys. Together. Thank you. Thanks, fellas. Right. Appendix A revisions. So we are asking the board to consider approving the adjustments to Appendix A. As you can say, as you can see, we have uh, highlighted the potential changes. One is related to when we have in house coverage by support staff members that have their teacher certification, that they would receive a compensation of $50 a day or $25 a half day over and above their normal holiday compensation. Uh, you can also see that we've made some adjustments for community ed compensation for the supervisor. Um, an hourly wage. So an example here is if we have somebody that comes in and needs to support um, a weekend community event, that would be the hourly wage for them to um, essentially be there, not just as like a custodian, but also take on the supervisory role. And then the, the um, events for community, usually we have a lead person. So an example you've probably seen on Facebook recently, the ceramics classes that are being run at Ocala Falls Elementary. There's whatever that lead person determines to be their per person um, cost, what they're charging, and then how they're going to put forth compensation to people that are going to assist them that would come out of whatever their proposal is. And that is kind of determined by market value. So ultimately, we as a district don't set the amount. Um, right now, I think it's $25 for somebody to come and participate in um, the ceramics situations. And she's determined that based on the cost of her supplies and, and the hours that she's putting in in preparation, the hours that she puts in after the class, and then depending on how many people sign up, then she has to pay out of that um, to the people that are helping to support those classes. And thus far it seems to be working well we've had some really positive feedback but we just wanted to to get this in our appendix a so that everybody's on the same page okay any questions or motion to approve yeah you need a motion to uh, i would so move Motion by Ken. I'll second. Oh, go ahead. Second by second. Sarah again. Mm -hmm. She's just slightly quicker than all of us. Any other discussion on this topic? Vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, next up, child care collaboration. So we wanted to bring you the board up to speed with some of the communications that have been happening over the last few months um, relative to potential child care in our area. At one point in a previous meeting, uh, I shared with you the board that we had had uh, conversations with staff from Encompass. And at that time we shared a little bit of history. Encompass is out of the Green Bay area and they have some um, different child care, one in, in Pulaski, one in the pier. Um, and they have an interest in coming here to our area. So as this moves forward, one of the things that uh, has come to our attention in working with their lead person is, as we would expect, they kind of have to have a business plan that would lead them to believe that 
coming here would be something that could be sustainable. And obviously we've shared with them that child care is a pretty significant need, not just in the kind of walls, but in surrounding communities. And, and we're very interested in, in having them come here. Um, we've had communications um, with folks from the hospital here in town, because obviously they would like to see child care come here as well. We've talked about as large employers, um, we tend to have employees that don't live in our area because of the lack of child care. And so then that causes them to be commuting and that affects our retention of staff. Um, so there's a lot of pieces to this that lead us to want to see this happen. One of the things that Encompass has shared with us is they're really looking to try to uh, establish what is going to be their revenue stream to support uh, them in this community. And they're looking for what does that look like from the private companies in the area? And then what does it potentially look like from public entities such as the school district? So we had had a sit down with them, multiple members of our team, met with multiple members of their team. We talked about ways that we could potentially help them logistically, um, whether it be the potential of some transportation services or um, just trying to look at how we might be able to help them as they try to get up and running. One of the questions that came forward was our interest in collaborating with them on 4K education. And we were slow to, to move forward with that because we feel pretty good about the 4K education that we currently provide. Uh, we currently have uh, half day 4K that's happening in both Oconnell Falls Elementary as well as Abrams. Um, we have three staff members that are doing this uh, morning and afternoon, and we have a strong program. Now, one of the things that I had brought up with Encompass is that we might be interested in looking to the future because right now for Oconnell Falls Elementary, we are pretty maxed out as far as space. So if we were to, in the future, see an increase um, in the number of 4K students and we had to add, let's say, a section or two, um, we would struggle right now anyways without taking some kind of significant action to find room for them, in which case we could see ourselves doing a collaboration where maybe we have uh, one of our staff members teaching 4K out of their site. Um, one of the models that Encompass had shared with us would be um, they already do some of this partnership with other school districts where they can either hire the staff member and provide the space and they just work with our students or it could be our staff working at their space to provide the services. And obviously there's a different cost per student depending on which program you look at. Uh, as you can imagine, as soon as you start getting down to this level of conversation, you want to try to talk with the people that are implementing. And so we actually have a couple members of our team sitting in the room tonight um, that were willing to come in and give me some perspective of the history of some of our 4K programming, as well as the nuances of how it works right now. And so we had teachers and administrators talking about what do we see as the potential positives and also potential drawbacks. Um, anytime you look at changing your programming, there's going to be challenges. And we have right now, if I look at it from a standpoint of influence, we have a lot more influence on what happens with our 4K students when they're in our school building with our staff. And if I'm prepping those 4K students to be prepared to be kindergarten students, when it's in the same building that they would be doing kindergarten, as you can imagine, they're learning not just our building, but they're learning our procedures and our expectations. And it's a pretty seamless transition. Um, if we then move some of our 4K programming offsite, uh, doesn't mean necessarily that that's going to be a problem, but it's gonna be different. Um, you're not going to have that same level of transition capacity. Um, we talked about you could still have students you know, interacting back and forth, but it's not gonna be on a daily basis the way they do it when they're in the same building. Um, it might not even be on a weekly basis, depending on your schedule and logistics. Um, we talked about the fact that change is, is difficult. 
And we realize right now how important it is to try to get childcare in our area. Um, and so one of the reasons to be bringing this to you this evening is to try to gauge your level of, of expectation for us. So one of my tasks is to come back to Encompass after you give feedback tonight to kind of update them on your feelings on this. So one potential course of action would be to go to Encompass and say, well, similar to what the discussion was previously, we could look at if we expand the number of students, we'd be interested in potentially doing a collaboration with you, you know, somewhere down the road, which doesn't identify a timeline. Um, I would say that as far as the, the impact on our programming, that, that would be helpful relative to the space need, but it is going to require us then to work with our staff to try to figure out how do you move that forward in the best way possible, knowing that there's going to be some challenges. If you wanted to go more aggressive than that, because that doesn't necessarily provide a real confident re revenue stream for Encompass, um, you could say by, let's say, the year 24-25, which would be two and a half years from now, um, <coughs> you could say we'll commit to providing two sections in a building if you were to have a building here in Oconto Falls. Now, that's a much more aggressive course of action. That is now us saying that we're going to commit to a financial input, which you're probably looking at sixty to $80,000 for a couple sections. If you figure out 15 students per section times two, 30 students uh, times $2,000 per student, and then you figure there's some other incidentals in there. So it's 60 or 80,000 you don't currently have in your budget slotted for that, that you'd have to designate. Now, could you do that? You could. Um, what you don't know on the backside of that equation is if you implement something like that, if you have childcare in your community, <clears throat> we've witnessed this from the other standpoint where when we don't have childcare, we lose some of our students through open enrollment to other places around us that have childcare, where the family takes the child outside of our community for the childcare, gets them enrolled in, you know, 4K programming, and then they just decide to stay there in the future. Now, that's approximately ten thousand dollar loss to the school district when they they leave. Not fully ten grand because there's a portion that stays with us even if they open enroll, but probably seven to eight thousand dollars. So you can see if you had 10 of those situations on the flip side that were going to come in, you just took your 60 to 80 thousand dollar input and brought that back to a neutral. There's no way to know that though. Okay. Um, that also creates some some challenges for our current situation. Um, because we don't have um, a need as far as moving kids out of their current situation. Um, this, this would be, it would be challenging. And what I mean by that is we would work together with building administration and staffing to figure out who are we going to move, uh, out of that current situation into a different site. Um, now, if you do it a couple of years from now, it might be a scenario where those people, um, decide that they would rather than move, teach at a different grade level or. You might figure out something else and you may end up having to be hiring somebody to do that, but that creates anxiety and stress. Um, it potentially creates some anxiety and stress for some of our parents because some of them may be excited about the idea of going to a different site and some of them may be not so excited and feel it's not a good thing. Whereas right now everything is just similar um, and you don't, you don't have the challenges. I bring this forward and I'm not, I'm not, trying to um, push an agenda other than to make you aware of what's going on behind the scenes right now. To do nothing is concerning because we may see an opportunity for childcare come and go. And then somebody might say, well, geez, if you, the district or you, the private entities had done something different, we could have childcare. Um, on the flip side, um, we're school district and we're, we're in, we're in the focus, the profession of, of educating children. 
And this is kind of an ancillary piece to that. I mean, we're, we're providing that education right now. Um, I'm trying to represent some of the, the comments that the lady shared. By the way, I was very appreciative. Um, our staff, you know, in situations like this show their professionalism. They're, they're, they're wanting to be supportive. And at the same time, they're wanting to give me honest feedback. They feel pretty good about the programming we're doing right now. And there's some anxiety about um, if we move in this other direction, will it, will it be a step, you know, in a different direction? Um, I'm hoping I'm representing you well over there. Uh, so I'm just, I'm wanting to make you aware. Ultimately, I have to reach back out to Encompass because Encompass has to go back to their board that they answer to relative to revenue stream. Now, I need to make a call. Uh, to a couple of the folks in the private sector here in the next couple of days and try to understand because Encompass basically said if if either the private or the public can come through with some of this, it will really support them coming into our community. It doesn't have to be both necessarily. Um, but I don't I haven't heard anything that the private has been able to nail down a commitment. So I'm not looking for you to take an action this evening. Um, other than to potentially give me some of your feedback or if you have questions that maybe jump into your mind. I did reach out to St. Anthony's, talk with Subeshta, made her aware of this. Um, so she's going to think about it a little bit more. Um, off the top of her head, she's not aware necessarily of another revenue stream. One of the things we had talked about is as a school district, we currently have kids stations which is, if you're not familiar, it's a wraparound program that we currently provide as part of our, our community service funding through Fund 80, um, which is a situation that it, it, we strive to have it break even. In some cases, um, we've actually been a little bit into the negative, and it's a service that we provide to our families. So for families that have students that need um, the other half of the day so they come in from morning 4k in the afternoon they can go to kids station here in the district whether it be you know at, at abrams or kind of falls elementary and then in some cases they need after school as well for parents to pick up after work we currently provide that this is something that could be done at encompass if encompass were to come into our community that wouldn't be a, a negative fiscally for us it would just be um, you know, basically, if, if Encompass could provide it, it would be a transition over to Encompass. One of the things that we, Encompass has told us that they would have similar costs. Um, we've, I'll say, pseudo verified that. Um, we haven't got the exact numbers. We gave them our numbers and they've told us that they're similar. Um, one of the things I will say is we really go above and beyond for our families. And so I would just want to make sure that. Um, there isn't a drastic difference in the level of support that we provide. We're pretty flexible and pretty understanding with folks. Um, so again, I would want to make sure that if we do a handoff, that, that handoff is a similar type product for our families. Otherwise, that could be seen as a not so good. And I'm, and I'm not, I want to make sure that everybody, I'm not, um, I always look at things very conservatively. I'm trying to plan for the worst and hope for the best. I've been very impressed with the Encompass team when they came to present to us. Um, when I've talked to other school districts, they've had very positive things to say about their collaborations with Encompass. Um, I just want to, I don't want to like, I'd rather under promise and over deliver, if that makes sense. So. Thoughts, questions? Just to be clear. So when you say add another one or two sections to 4K, you're talking about taking one section from Opus and moving it to Encompass, or just keeping what we have at Opus and then adding maybe an additional so the two feature course, over there? The two courses of action that I'm thinking about, one would be that we don't change anything within our system. And we simply say to Encompass that if we get another 15 students, and we need to open up another section that we could open up that section on their site with one of our staff members. 
Now, in that situation, it wouldn't be one of our current staff members because they're already actively engaged with their students. But if we get additional students, we have to hire a person. So now that doesn't mean it couldn't be one of ours going over there. If somebody says, hey, I really want to go, well, great. But more than likely, they're probably happy where they are. And now we'd be looking to hire someone to open up a section there. In that situation, I would propose that we would hire the person, we would compensate the person, but they would work offsite. Um, so that's one option. That option only occurs if you get additional 4K students. If you don't get additional 4K students, then nothing happens. The other more aggressive is to commit to, by a certain timeline, um, that you would add a section or add two sections or whatever you want to commit to. Um, in which case, you're saying that if you don't get more kids in that timeline, you're then going to move them out of your current school and put them on a different site. That's why I had the eyebrow raise. If you do get more students in that timeline, well, then you kind of fall back on that, that first course of action. It's less invasive. But even there, I would fully anticipate you're going to have some challenges because now you're operating two different types of scenarios and that usually causes some logistical strain based on what some people will want or not want. Are there districts in our area that are using that model and do we know what their experience and challenges are? There are. Um, and I've had some level of interaction with those folks, but I haven't gotten real aggressive with gathering the information simply because I didn't know where you were at. Um, Pulaski interacts. Um, that was going on. Um, before the current superintendent, so I would actually need to talk to the principal. Um, Terry and I have had some conversations. In fact, I think you might know that person over there. Uh, Missy in, from Encompass gave us the name of someone that we can contact in Pulaski. Yeah, I think the peer is also has a model. West of here. Okay, so there are a couple different districts that we can reach out to to try to gather more info. A lot of this hinges on how much do we want to push to try to get child care in our area. I guess my first thought is, uh, you know, being being as you had mentioned, we're in the education business, and uh, this is a this is a, a community based education business. We are there. There definitely is a need. So I think those those two uh, things can kind of mesh, uh, you know, the need for child care in the community and the potential for uh, what what uh, that kind of a situation could do for our uh, for the educate for our education. You know, we know what early childhood. You hear more and more about the importance of early childhood education as far as uh, academic success in students. So uh, I would think that would be, it seems to me that that would be a, uh, a positive that, uh, that we should, uh, you know, look into or, or, or strongly, strongly look into and see if we can uh, adopt or adapt or, or help with. Terry, was there anything from your perspective that I missed or omitted that should be brought forward? Because you were part of those conversations as well. Um, no, I think no, I think you summarized it pretty well. I mean, I think we were definitely when we talked to Encompass, we're like, you know, giving them the verbal like, if you build it, they will come, and that was you know kind of so we're definitely trying to support what they're doing. Um, it just gets really sticky when you get into that partnership with them mm. where there's a financial and, you know, program change. And there's just a lot to think about in that realm. So, I mean, I'm, I'm hopeful that the private sector can support. Um, <clears throat> we've talked, I've talked with Encompass and Head Start trying to give them, you know, that it, connecting up Head Start with Encompass because Head Start um, is another funding source, um, but, you know, I, Encompass, you know, didn't seem like that was going to be enough. You know, there was no guarantee with the Head Start that we'd get the numbers to fill those seats, but 
um, it's definitely a community. It's a tough situation to be in because we're we work, you know, our 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 job is education, and this is such a you know this is a community thing that is really needed by this community, and it's like it kind of feel bad, you know. I mean, we feel like why why do we have to be the ones to stick our neck out next out? So hopefully the you know. The, uh, private sector can can rally some of their troops, um, and you know, and I think we we try to get feedback as to what I think the ladies had some great points as to what those differences would be in that type of programming, and I think that would be a lot to think through, a lot to think through, plan through. Mm -hmm. If we did a partnership, it's it's not just the here, you know, we give you our students. There's a lot to think through as to what those differences in programming might look like, um, and. That's that would be a lot of conversation. Consistency, I think, was one of the big things that we were talking about the other day to try to ensure that, that the education of the student is going to be consistent, whether they would be on one side or the other. Mm -hmm. Ladies, I don't want to put you on the spot, but is, I'm going to ask you the question I just asked Terry. Is there anything from your perspective that I haven't brought up that you think is, is important? I really, by the way, I appreciated your input the other night at the meeting, and I really appreciate you being here tonight. I think that what you've said is exactly what we discussed at the meeting and hit all the points and our main concern was the consistency with the kids getting the same education in both places. <clears throat> we just really need a lot more information. Along with that, just being briefed initially right now, I just feel like with this onion, there's a lot of layers that need to be peeled back. And it's hard for me to tell you or advise, do I feel this way or do I feel that way? I think one of my main, main concerns initially is I'm a proponent of having kids in a classroom in our facilities because that's where they start to grow together. And then when you have to pick, well, this handful is going to be off site over here, that's where you start losing the consistency of our educators versus, or who are, I mean, I just think there's a communication difference too as to not saying there isn't going to be communication, but things can get lost um, there. And um, I, 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 I just feel strongly about keeping our kids as close as we can to our facilities at such a young age, too, because it all starts young. You know, that's kind of where I'm stuck right now. I think our focus, you know, obviously is the education piece and to have the education piece be as strong as it can, as consistent as it can. And Dean, you may have mentioned this earlier and I didn't click. So if I'm asking you to repeat, I'll apologize in the front end. Is in, you mentioned that Encompass is worried about having kids, having clients. And is that because they think they would be price prohibitive? Because if there's such a, a dearth of childcare facilities, even before school age. You know what's what's their concern, and how do they? I think that they're. They I think they're just wanting to. It, it's a big investment for them. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're looking at. You know, to come into the community, they have to purchase a piece of property. They're more than likely going to have to invest a significant amount to remodel the property to get it up to codes and standards, mm -hmm. um, and they're just wanting to. I would think as much as possible identify that they're going to have that fiscal resource available. Now, I have reason to believe they've done a significant amount of homework to look at how is child care being addressed currently and what's the level of need. Um, this is just one more piece to that puzzle. Okay. So my perception is for people I know who have uh, children in daycare centers, <clears throat> obviously not in O'Connell Falls, um, it's very expensive and in some cases expensive enough that it causes parents to have to really rethink what's happening. There's a whole other social layer to that whole piece about um, can both parents afford to even work? You know, it, it gets to be that level. And the childcare providers need to be paid for the professional work they do. So there's a disconnect between that whole system and I, I would love to say that I think we it'd be an opportunity for the district to get in at some level to 
give this thing a kick, but I, I'm not seeing it right now in this moment exactly what that would be yeah. without maybe understanding it a little bit more. Okay. I'd say everybody, I mean, just listen to everybody. I think there's, there's support and a desire to see something in the community. We're just not at a point yet where we can make any sort of firm commitment or even allude to a firm commitment that helps them put those revenue dollars in their ROI projections. Um, I think there's an opportunity to work together in the future if we end up having you know large enough class sizes or need to need to, need to do something. But you know to to put a I don't want to speak on behalf of everybody, but I mean to to kind of say hey in in two three years we'd be willing to do this. I, I just I think we're not in a position to be able to do that. Yeah, I feel that's premature right now. Yeah, but. That said, I think we're all supportive of, Take care of, them. of yeah. them making making a go of it. Okay. Okay. All right. I think you've given me what I need. I appreciate it. Okay. And I think with that, we're ready for a closed session. Okay, Brian. Uh, the board will consider convening in a closed session pursuant to Wisconsin statute section 19.851E to conduct specific public business whenever competitive or bargaining reason to fire for a session, specifically to discuss the potential sale of district real estate and pursuant to Wisconsin statute sec section 19.851C to consider employment, promotion, compensation, or performance evaluation data of any public employee over which the board has jurisdiction specifically to discuss a personal conduct investigation. All second. Motion by Brian, second by Jan. Uh, let's see your roll call, please. Schindel? Yes. Baumler? Yes. Early? Yes. Harder? Yes. Adler? Yep. Strands, yes. Gardner? Yes. Seven zero.